getting a sense that 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 collaboration and those partnerships really are not only about the the large scale of the Great Lakes region, which we're all very much focused on, but they also happen at the sub-regional level. And we heard from Mayor Hartwell that they really also happen very much at that local community level. <coughs> Where does capital form? Where does money flow? Right? Where are choices made? And how does that ultimately drive the vision for the region? And how do we and others really look for the impediments to that healthy economic, social, cultural, and environmental out set of outcomes that we really all desire? As you start to think about your questions for the panel, and we have a bit of time for questions, which is good. Um, Emery, you have the microphone, so you can, you can, if you don't mind, work in the audience a little bit. I think that's what you planned on doing, so that's great. Um, I was going to start with one question as you, uh, as you kind of formulate yours. If I gave you each, I'm going to be very generous here, if I gave you each $500,000, what is the one issue, you get one and you get a minute or less, what is the one issue that you would tackle next? Five hundred grand. Um, I would go with the. Uh, I would continue with our work on the economic effects of declining or changes to Great Lakes water levels. I think the economic uh, and environmental synergy is key, and whatever we can do to create a long-term sustainable economy environment, nothing else matters after that. Easy transportation funding and finding a, a long and sustainable way to uh, fund transportation for the country and especially for this region. I hope you guys are writing these down. <laughs> these are these are doable questions. I'd put the arm on you for another five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> okay, five hundred grand to build the business case for the five million dollar ass. I got it. Yeah. And, and if I had it, I would probably try to train some of our folks on the border that there's a trade-off between risk and trade, and that making us wait longer in line is great because they think you make mistakes and you can identify criminals, but I'd like to see trade flow more freely, and I'd spend the money on that. J.D., half a million. Set up a grant program to uh, encourage grant projects based on binational strategies in the green chem biomanufacturing area and transportation logistics. There you go. There's your work, right? That's only $2 million for the whole Great Lakes region. That's doable. Two and a half. <laughs> Two and a half. That's right. All right, all right. <laughs> Um, let, me, let me turn to you now. I have other questions I can ask, but I, I certainly will turn to you and let's see what kind of, uh, what, what's on your mind here from, from this panel and, and how this panel can reflect on some of the other work that we've been talking about. Otherwise, I'll keep asking questions. <laughs> and they get harder. <laughs> I don't have 2.5 million. Uh, I'm Dan Yutso from Dickinson, right? Uh, and it's great. We're supporters of a number of the organizations represented here. Um, I still think the Great Lakes Metro Chambers is, the, for what it's worth, the best thing we have going in the region right now in terms of getting Cleveland, Detroit, Buffalo, et cetera, to play nice and, and go utilize our political muscle. I think we still have 250 paid campaign staff in Ohio right now. It's, uh, there is some influence that we have in the region. But I was thinking, something Roy Norton said earlier got me thinking when he was giving the stats on the shorelines, which is, all of us that are champions for the region talk about we're the fourth largest economy collectively, but within, and for the outward world, and we'll be hearing from the South, our friends from the Southeast later today, we're branding ourselves as the Great Lakes region. But internally, I query whether we think of ourselves as the Great Lakes region. Um, I live in Columbus. You start talking Great Lakes, eyes blaze over. Uh, you think five of our states, the capital cities, are not on the lakes? Mm -hmm. Five of our governors aren't from Great Lakes states. They didn't grow up on both, or from the region. They didn't grow up. So how do you successfully pitch us as a region externally when internally we still have some work to do? What are your strategies for doing that? And additionally, a, re a related concept is in terms of playing nice, and I'd love to hear how <laughs> the story goes. I can recall sitting at a Midwest Governors Association meeting, and everybody was talking about collaboration. And finally, somebody from Indiana stuck their hand up and said, we don't play nice with anybody. And our governor doesn't want us to either. And we can all talk collaboration, but once we get out of here, the economic development professionals are measured on certain metrics as to what they're bringing home. What are the tricks that, and the tools of the trade metrics that you use to actually incentivize collaboration and cooperation? Well, that, that's a hard question, so I'll turn to them to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> they're growing 
You want to come on up and use the mic? It, sure. It, it's a little bit. I think that's at the crux of what we're talking it is. about. Yeah. It is. So we won't put it all on you, Carol. The I'm happy to audience. happy to kick it off. Uh, it's a very important question, and thank you for the um, support of our organization. I really think that our organization is one way to do that because we are working with the chambers of commerce in a lot of those cities you're talking about. Uh, we have Pittsburgh at the table now. We're close with Columbus, Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. Kentucky, Erie, Pennsylvania, we're really working hard to bring them uh, to the core of our organization because you are absolutely right. I, I'm two hours and 15 minutes from Columbus. I'm not sure some of them know that the Great Lakes are there. I'm not sure. So we have a lot of branding to do amongst us. I could not agree with you more. Um, but to the point of playing nice, uh, again, I, I want to tell you that that's one of the missions of our organization. When we go to Washington, even on funding issues, we have a list of projects that are regional. I lobby for that bridge. I lobby for the, the Brent Spence Bridge in, in Cincinnati, for the rail project in, in uh, Chicago. We're all conversant on those and we all go in together. We do set aside our territorial and our parochial interests for the moment. I've got plenty of that to do back in Cleveland, but I think we all are beginning to understand that this region has to speak with one voice. I understand what that bridge is going to do for Cleveland. So we really try hard to do that. And I think it's our work, just as I know you all do this too, but our work at those local smaller chamber uh, organizations and in the state capitals can make a big difference. And it's a mission that we all share. I'm going to go just a little bit wonky because everybody needs uh, some, some wonkiness. Um, I, I think, you know, incentivize is great, but it's also tying our hands so that we don't revert to our worst protectionist excesses. I think this is something that Ed and I were talking about yesterday. It's great to market the region in tourism and investment when everybody's, you know, feeling fairly flush, but when the pie is getting smaller and smaller and you're competing against your neighbor, then those protectionist instincts come out. And so things like regulatory agreements, bilateral regional commitments that you can't backslide on when times get tough, that's what builds the, the regional feeling. That's what integrates economies. And so that's why we need to move beyond best efforts and into things that lock us together, uh, into public-private partnerships, into national and uh, sub-federal agreements, uh, regulatory things which prevent us from going protectionist, from uh, uh, you know, messing up the neighbor when there's no other option. Interesting question, and I believe last night, Dan, I did ask you for two and a half million bucks, didn't I? Uh, and I just met you. Uh, but it, I'd like to answer that sort of from a research-oriented position. I had the opportunity a number of years ago to work with a large electronics manufacturer and look at their top 200 relationships globally and how they manage those. And so the, the number one answer is a lot to do with trust. The number two answer is, it's not a zero-sum game. If you get something, we lose. If we all win, we win together. And what I found in that study, because we did both surveys, but we got to talk to people that, in some cases, the two individuals were responsible for a billion dollars worth of business. And some people acted in their own self-interest. And in those cases, they were looking for, I tell my students, what gets measured gets done. So those metrics were, hey, if I can save a nickel on this hard drive, I win. But they beat that partner up for price. And so that partner did not stick share strategic information with them, which led that business to not perform as well. And then other businesses where they gave them strategic information, they didn't beat them up on price, they told them about new innovations that were coming when the new chips were coming out because that trust and the capabilities built together and they both did better together as opposed to the one that was always looking out for their self-interest and it wasn't just one, there were many partners, over time did much worse. So I think groups, relationships, both globally and regionally are critically important because you're not gonna do it by yourself. Thank you. 
I really like this notion that when best practice becomes best process and best policy, this, this interrelationship that sort of hardens those healthy relationships as we go. Governor. Yeah, I was going to add to, to Dan's question, um, because I've looked at this for yeah, 30 years. Uh, it was not hard to get the governors and the legislatures and the environmental and community leaders to agree on cooperation when it was protecting the Great Lakes. I mean, it was a little harder with Indiana, I must admit, because um, they don't always think of it. I mean, they only have a small strip, and they thought they had some leading edge on polluting that would be cheaper for business. But, but I think that's changed. I do think that. I do too. But we did not have a hard time getting a consensus on protecting the Great Lakes from diversion, from a toxics cleanup, Great Lakes Protection Fund. Remember, the Great Lakes Protection Fund, as you know, John, it was the first of its kind in many, many years. A regional fund, fund, to go forward and worry about cleanup and best technologies, where we pooled our money. I mean, that's, that's, so with that, and with Ontario, and to some degree Quebec, we were able to do that. The hard part, which Dan alluded to, was economic development, where every state is fighting for right. itself along yeah. with Ontario. But as Carol said, when all of a sudden you start talking about a bridge which benefits jobs and trade in Ohio, in Illinois, in Indiana, in Wisconsin, all of a sudden, again, there was a coming together. It was really interesting of the political community, to, with, with one exception over here, but basically the political community, business community, labor community, everybody on infrastructure. What I have found is that one of the great things about Canada, U.S., or Michigan, Ontario, or Great Lakes with Canada, is by focusing on what we have in common in the region with Canada, it's going to help drive our states to thinking more and more about cooperating with each other. Because we come together to work with Canada. We come together to protect the Great Lakes. We come together to improve our infrastructure. I agree with you on transportation funding. We come together to think about air quality, tourism, um, and it's going to help pull us together in the region in which we have, yes, been competing. And once the Great Lakes meeting, we propose that we have a level playing field on regulation in the Great Lakes region, uh, kind of a, a, uh, a disarmament pact where we wouldn't try to outdo each other with incentives. And almost every state agreed except one. It was interesting. Um, so, but we're making a lot of progress, and you see that with your counterparts, do you not, John? Absolutely. We, what, what we saw, too, was as the governors reconvene and reassert their collective voice, not their, just their individual voice, that, that really doesn't just bring the Great Lakes region together, that brings the Great Lakes states and provinces together. I mean, Mackinac was an example of that. Uh, we heard resoundingly on Mackinac this summer that the governors and premiers wanted to meet immediately, you know, within within 12 months. We're going to do it within 10 months. Um, and they, they want to keep that process up because they see the value, not just for the region, right, and this brand of the Great Lakes, but for the states and the provinces as an intact unit. That's a pretty big geography to help drive. But you have to drive that through executive voice. And I think bringing that voice in really helps solidify that set of relationships. Let's do another question from the floor. And I'm not sure where the mic went. I guess it's, oh, here it is. Ah. We'll, we'll put him to work some more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning. Good morning. Peter Pullo with RSG, which is a national consulting firm based in New England, actually. Um, I guess my question, changing direction a little bit here, but related to transportation and funding, is how important is the St. Lawrence Seaway widening, deepening, to the future of this region. Um, it's been talked about for eons, and we know that it kind of ebbs and flows in terms of, seems like, interest and willingness to pursue things with the Wellington Canal and the Seaway itself. So I'd just be curious about perspectives on how important that is and what can be done going forward. Everybody's looking at me. Dan, do you, want to, do you want to start? We'll start with Dan. I'll start. You can finish, Dan. The Alpha and Omega. Good question. Um, well, first off, I'm going to put in a little uh, plug for the Detroit Chamber. If you're really interested, you should be at Detroit. Is Ben here today? Should be at Detroit tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning. 
because they're going to have the CEO. Well, flight is canceled. <laughs> <laughs> and that's if you fly to Halifax, that happens all the time. Um, but tomorrow at the Detroit Chamber, they're going to have the CEO of the Canadian side of the Great Lakes Seaway. We, they were going to have the U.S. side, but uh, since the government shut down, they, that person can't come. I think the Seaway is important. It's, you know, if you look at transportation, it's part of the answer. I have a, a colleague and friend, Brad Hull, who you should talk to. He's a, a, an advocate for the Seaway and just held a conference um, in Europe this past spring about it. There's ships bringing in lots of stuff from Russia and from Europe. The understanding of the seaway, people think it's closed all the time. People are putting it out there as another mode of transportation. Water is the least expensive mode of transportation, hence Halifax, deep seaport, very good. Um, I don't think it's the only answer, but I think it would help save some money and help make this region a little more competitive, um, especially to Europe. So that's my partial answer. Let me, let me add just quickly to that and say um, the, the work that the Council of the Great Lakes Governors is doing with their Maritime Task Force are really starting to sort of think through some of those issues. Um, what we're seeing, though, is just a radical transformation of worldwide trade, certainly with the opening of Panama Canal and really the eventual opening of the Northwest Passage over some period of time, those northern routes that are about 30% less distance to Asian market, back and forth from Asian market, both out of Europe and, and the US. Pretty profound changes in worldwide shipping. Container ships now are carrying 15, 17, 18,000, 20,000 plus containers. Changes the whole nature of that. Those ships are not coming to the Great Lakes. I mean, the, uh, har the, 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 the ports on the East Coast are dredging to 47, 48, 49, 50 feet to accommodate those ships coming in, and Great Lakes dredges right now to 27. Um, that's, that's a lot of dredging, right, that we're barely keeping up with what we have now. So the notion of expanding the seaway to accommodate Panamax and post-Panamax ships is not there. However, it makes us really think deeply about what Great Lakes integrated shipping looks like relative to these huge changes in worldwide trade relative to Panama, relative to North Sea shipping and integrated markets. So I'll answer it that way and say there's work to be done here. I don't have anything to offer. That's great. <laughs> well said. I guess it's my job to go back to the political side of the spectrum. We should not overlook the fact that former Congresswoman Betty Sutton from Ohio is the new administrator and take advantage of that. She loves this region. She was one of the floor managers for the Great Lakes Compact and understands the significance of this. So I just urge you to keep that in mind. She could be a real champion and we need to all reach out to her uh, to help us. She also was the sponsor of Cash for Clunkers. That is right, <laughs> Cash for Clunkers. Yes. yes, I wanted to just add to uh, what you said, Governor, about the importance of the governors in this region. And it sounds to me like every time they get together, it's really good. But we don't hear about it outside that small arena. And what I think we need to do is perhaps, Governor, you could champion this, get all the governors of the Great Lakes to do an op-ed piece, the current governors, about the significance of Canada and this region and run it in all of our newspapers. Good idea. Good idea. That's, write that down, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she ran, she's running to the table. That's great. Um, and this is not only about what governments are doing. This is really also about where private capital is flowing. Uh, I think we're going to see some interesting things. We met with Cle the Ports of Cleveland yesterday, and I think they're coming up with some very innovative uh, notions. They didn't share them all with us, but I think there's going to be some interesting announcements coming out of Cleveland in terms of what they're, what they're thinking about relative to not just public money, but private money as well. So let's take another question. We have maybe five or six minutes, maybe one or two more questions. I have another question. All right. How, how can I defer? <laughs> how can I say no? <laughs> see, what, see what you get when you sit in the front row? <laughs> My question is, it's, I should be able to answer it, but I can't, because uh, I haven't really explored it. But I'm wondering if any of you know, or anyone in the room knows, what are the, obviously there are a lot of great colleges and universities and community colleges in our region. We know that. It's always been high brain power region. And that's the future. It's attractive, attractive, it's to, power. It's, attractive to the world. It's human capital. We know that. 
We all know that. I don't care whether it's manufacturing, whatever it is, it's, it's human investment, intellectual capital. What are our big 10, for example, they could take, what are our big 10 universities doing to collaborate for the region? What are they doing? Because that's, you know, you, you can go right from Penn State to Minnesota, and you know, we, you got it. You got huge learning centers, huge research centers. Does anybody know to what degree they're collaborating on this, on this project that we're all committed to here? I do know we have 19, 19 of the world's leading, this region has 19 of the world's leading research institutions right here. How they're collaborating, I don't know, but I would imagine perhaps you do. <laughs> <laughs> Episodic is the answer. I know that between Dalhousie and Michigan State, we've been doing great things together. I know that when I was a supply chain professor here previously, and by the way, I'm now teaching a course this semester here, um, that research I talked about was funded by IBM, but it was a collaboration with Michigan State, Penn State, Arizona State University, um, National University Singapore, and University College Dublin. So there's a lot of different things, but I, I think it's the same thing. There's not a lot of awareness. I just got involved in a study funded by the Canadian government called Borders and Globalization. And there's probably about 25 universities worldwide involved in that. And not just looking at Canada, US, but looking at how can we make it easier for global trade. So there are initiatives. I don't think we do a good job letting people know about them. So thank you. I'll just grab the mic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any better answer as to how our Big Ten are doing, but I can tell you that one of the impediments to how our Big Ten or Big 20 or Big 50 are doing is the way that our education and research funding model operates, which is on a national level. So if the government of Canada is giving research money, it really is very difficult for their natural counterpart in Michigan to get a piece of that. Um, we fund nationally and we fund to, to some extent at state and provincial level, uh, but then it's at the university and the department to say, well, how can we share this up with the partners that it makes sense to do so? You add in then the complications of funding through the private sector, and in Canada we don't do that particularly well at all, and you have very small isolated the pockets of cooperation. Now I understand somebody here will probably know better. On the auto sector, we actually do have better pockets of cooperation between uh, uh, Detroit and Windsor on research there. Um, but generally, we don't cooperate very well at all because our funding pie is national and we, you know, the, the border matters very much there in education and research funding. I, yeah, I think I think we see a, a lot of collaboration actually in the environmental space. Uh, a number of universities work on a number of not all of them necessarily in all the projects, but universities are partnering on a number of things in the environmental space, whether it's looking at nitrogen or nutrients or algae, whatever those things are. Um, I'm, I, I think you see collaborations within sectors, whether it's supply chain. Uh, I'm not sure that there's sort of deeper integration around systems. Those are hard to do. They're hard to do disciplinarily. They're hard to do organizationally and operationally, and they're hard to do for funding. And I think those are the messages and uh, some of the things that we need to keep asking people to do more of. There's huge power here. There's huge capacity here. Um, any, any other questions from the floor? Uh, we, we're going to transition here to lunch in a minute. I did have one quick question uh, before we transition. And that's really on the nature of innovation. And I want to ask this as a challenge question. Um, not necessarily that we will all know all the details of the answers, but I want to ask this as a question of, do we have an innovation culture in the Great Lakes? And, and what does that mean? We have had an innovation culture, and we may still have innovation pieces in the Great Lakes. Do we have a deep innovation culture in the Great Lakes? That's not just on you know, hard technologies and things we invent to put on stuff, but that's also in terms of policy and practice and, and, and direction. So do we have an innovation culture in the Great Lakes? Good luck with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Start with, I'll end with the easy one. I, I think our history would tell you yes, absolutely. 
basically look at the history of innovation in this region, and you can only come to that conclusion. But I do worry that it is starting to decline a little bit, and I worry that part of that is the result of a lack of involvement in venture capital funding and that if you're watching that industry right now it's starting to go way way down and part of that is a state responsibility but i th and we need ohio certainly has their problems there but we need to look state by state and and determine what is the correct role for government in helping that valley of death part of the funding cycle for um, innovators and if there is a way to encourage that at the national level, we ought to all be doing that. So I do worry that it's starting to slip a little bit. You're looking at me. I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm first. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, absolutely. We have an innovation culture in, in the Great Lakes, and you alluded to the history of, and somewhere in a notebook I have all of the inventions and all of the patents and all of the wonderful things that were discovered here, including bubble gum. I remember bubble gum was on my list. Um, what we also have is a tendency to have great ideas and take them elsewhere. Um, you, you want to set up a manufacturing facility? Well, let's go to Mexico, let's go to China, let's go to someplace else. So what we need to do is to figure out how to bring the manufacturing or at least more of the value chain activities back to this region. And that is not by engaging in beggar thy neighbor activities um, in order to get you know, the lowest cost labor solution. That is investing in technologies and advanced manufacturing so that we can do as much as, capture as much of that value here rather than shipping it south or east. JD? Well, obviously, we have a tradition of innovation uh, and a history of innovation. But I would also argue that any company that made it through 08, 09, and early 2010 had to be innovative just to survive and get through. And I, and I mean that quite literally. Um, we've spent a lot of time interviewing companies to gauge how many of them were exporting and what we could do to encourage their exporting. And in the course of many of those interviews, uh, the, the kinds of things that they reported on, either in terms of product development, uh, new product applications, process modifications, they were doing something to change how they were doing their business and producing in order to simply survive and keep their doors open. So I think very definitely we have a, a, an underappreciated culture of, of innovation, and I think we probably need some policy adjustments here and there that can really help unleash some of that entrepreneurial, innovative energy that's there. But uh, again, I would argue that uh, innovation is pretty pretty strong in our region. Yeah. And just to mirror that, I would say you know we've had a great history of innovation. Um, and still, if you talk to the folks in the automobile industry, the ag industry, the two leading industries in Michigan, I think you made a great point. They survived and they're doing a good job. Also, every day when I teach my students, whether it's last semester, I think I had 125 total. This semester, I've got 66. They're great and they are willing to work hard. And to Bill's point, I don't want to see us lose them in Michigan. I want to see us be able to create jobs and keep them here because they're very innovative. Thank you. And to tie that around, one of the reasons I wanted to come back around to that notion, uh, it really starts to, I think, tie back to some of the first speeches we heard today, this notion of jobs, keeping our kids here, creating a culture and telegraphing a culture of what we think both the future holds and what the present holds, um, and, and making sure that that story is durable, that we're dislodging the old notion. And, and I challenge you and your colleagues and others to really think through the details of what that innovation looks like and, and encourage it and nurture it and find opportunities for it because I, I do think that's where hope lies. You know, Bill Rustam earlier talked about sort of this notion of hope and hope lies in, the, in, in those possibilities and part of that possibility lies in, in understanding and nurturing that culture of innovation on all the issues that we're talking about, whether it's trade, whether it's agriculture, whether it's technology, whether it's policy, whether it's practice, those all require innovation and thoughtfulness. That's what will keep people here. That's where people will start to choose to grow a family here, to grow a business here, to take a risk here, to look for money here, to put their money back into the region and continue that. That there is a great history and a great legacy. And I think innovation is one of those 
key pieces that we need to make sure we're nurturing. It is a policy tool. It is a management tool that we have, and we need to work towards that innovative culture. With that, I will turn it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the panel with me, please. With that, I will turn the uh, podium back to Anne Marie. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, we've heard a lot about jobs, innovation. We've had a number of representatives um, in and out of the room today, and we hope that continues. Uh, we have Senator Anderson over to our to my right. Uh, we have Carl Evans' office uh, represented in the back. Raise your hand. <laughs> 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 but you know this com or this conversation is really a terrific lead-in to um, asking Representative Lowers from Port Huron to come up and just say a few words about jobs, innovation, and particularly Michigan Michigan's Competitiveness Council. Okay. Thank you. I'll make this brief because I know I'm standing between your you know lunch so and I've got to get to the floor here soon but my name is Dan Lowers I'm a freshman representative uh, from St. Clair County uh, and to give you a little bit of my background I own a grain elevator uh, today I'll be hauling soybeans from the thumb of Michigan to uh, a yard in De Dearborn where we'll put them on shipping containers that will be railed to a port and shipped overseas uh, so I deal with the things that you're dealing with every day I'm on CN mainline um, so lots of experience in this area and, and real motivation and I'm here because of the same reasons that you are here and so I have a an invitation uh, and a challenge for you today um, for all the reasons you're speaking about uh, the legislature has formed the Michigan Competitiveness Committee this year uh, Mike Shirky is our chairman and he's asked me to come here and invite you to identify those actionable items that we can take up in the committee room, which is just around the corner over here, where we meet each week. Uh, we are really looking to identify the barriers and the opportunities you know, to bring the investment. What do we have to do in this area, in Michigan, specifically in the legislature, you know, to, to move our region forward? Um, we have a perfect opportunity here. We're not limited. This It's kind of a, a little bit of a magic time with this committee because we have no history. Uh, we are not limited by uh, topic or scope. And so, you know, where, whereas many things might have to go to, to tax or judiciary or commerce or all that stuff, uh, with, with this committee, we're kind of wide open. Okay, and we, and we see the challenges the same as you do. So, um, but, but at the same time, we are, I think, challenged as a committee to, to identify those actionable items that we can move through the legislature to make this happen. So I'm thrilled that you're all here. It's exciting to see uh, such a great group come together and, and, and face down those same challenges that we're looking at. And so uh, Anne-Marie knows how to get a hold of me and and, uh, and I hope that you'll use her as a, as a conduit to uh, uh, come before our committee and share our ideas so that we can uh, make things happen. So thank you very much and uh, I'll be available. Thank you. Thank you.